today. Well, I'm glad that you're here for the drive-in service. Who's happy to be at the drive-in service today? Everybody? Amen. Amen. Yeah. I am too. This is exciting. This is really great. I'm telling you. However, the, the irony of it all, I, the car guy, I, the love the cars, I, that used to sneak in in the back of my buddy's uh, 69 Mercury Cyclone. You could put four dead bodies in the back of that Cyclone. Uh, but I would do that. What did I do? I walked over, left my car home today. So I walked to the drive-in today. How crazy is that? I love driving, though. I think driving, this is so great. And it's so great to see everybody here today. It's just exciting. I cannot tell you how thrilling it is for me personally to be seeing you all back again. You know, I know most of you see us every Sunday. Uh, we see who you are on the, on the counts for the, the YouTube videos and for all the online worship. But it's exciting to see so many of you back here. So uh, you get to see us, but we hardly get to see you. And I want to tell you, I just want to thank you all for being here. I also want to give a big thanks to everybody that put in the hard work to get this online and to get this up and running. So let's all give them some honky applause there for uh, absolutely. Thank you. Amen. Amen. They did a, did, a, did a great job. Those poor golfers over there, they're just about ready to mess up their strokes. Don't worry to the golfers. We're talking about driving today, though. You know, <laughs> some must not like golfing. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we are glad that you're here. Uh, how'd you get here? You had to drive here. Uh, what did you drive? You know, I remember when I was a kid, driving was a big thing for me. I was very excited to get my driver's license. Uh, but it was much more important not just to get driver's license, but to get a cool car to drive. That, that was a, uh, one of the high priorities. You know, what were you driving? That was the big question. Uh, and I, was, I, I saved my nickels and saved my dimes. And, and my dad uh, sort of uh, helped out a little bit. And I got myself a nice a 72 Mustang. And that was, that was the first car. And I loved driving that thing around. I love to take a good drive. And for many years, that's all I thought about. What am I driving? What am I driving? But that's not the real question that we need to ask ourselves today. Not what are we driving, but the question is, what's driving us? Not what are we driving, but what's driving us? Let's pray. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, come into this place, into this time. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. And all God's saints said, amen. Gathered friends, may grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, who is our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. I just want you to know something today. Today's gospel lesson is about the most driven gospel lesson that you can think of. Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter. But before we get to that, I want us to think about that word driven. What is it to be driven? Here we've driven here to church. We're in a drive-in setting. But what is it to be driven? Uh, the folks out on the golf course, uh, uh, they know. They, they want to get a nice drive so they can get closer from the tee to the green. In baseball, uh, you want to be able to drive the ball. You want to be able to, 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 to hit a line drive uh, between uh, you know, the, the first baseman and the second baseman. So it goes in for a hit. You want to be able to drive the ball. Now, uh, if you happen to be a, a cattle rancher, uh, and you know there are probably some people that have had to, to do this, uh, certainly here in North Dakota, uh, there's certainly plenty of ranching. Well, driving means something entirely different. Driving means taking those cattle and, and driving them from one end of the field to the other. You can obviously tell that I don't know anything about cattle ranching whatsoever. But, I do know that that's what things that happens there. Also, another thing that's important for us to think about when we think about driving, uh, suppose that uh, uh, you are a, uh, oh, there it goes over there, having fun like there. Uh, uh, you know, carpenters, they drive nails. Uh, they drive nails in, in, into wood. Uh, people who are putting up tents, if you're going camping, you've got to put a, a, a tent peg in the ground. Uh, uh, that certainly uh, uh, gets driven in there. There are all sorts of ways that we can use the word driven. If you're having a stewardship drive, are you driving a nail on the ground? No, you're talking about raising money. So what is it that we're talking about when we say drive? It can mean so many different things. What does it mean to be driven? 
Well, the driven that I want to talk to you about today is simple. It's about what motivates us. And not simply what motivates us, what gives us energy, what gives us enthusiasm, what leads us forward, what gets us going when there's obstacles in our way. Because anybody can go forward without any obstacles. That's simple. If there's no obstacles in front of you, then going forward is no problem. But how do you go forward when there are obstacles that stand between you and your objective? What is it that drives you? What is it that gets you moving ahead? Well, that's for us to consider today. And I'd like us to consider what drives us by considering Jesus and what drives Jesus. When we read through the Gospels, we see that clearly Jesus is a person who is driven. Jesus is clearly a person that has a mission. Jesus is a person of incredible clarity when it comes to what that mission is. And he is, unde he is not to be dissuaded in any way, shape, or form to prevent any, that he will be prevented from carrying out his mission. And I think it's important for us to consider that for ourselves. So let me think about this. I'd like you to think about it this way, that there are four things that I think that Jesus is driven to in particularly. First of all, Jesus was driven first and foremost by an overwhelming sense of obedience to the Father. Let me say that again. Jesus was driven by an overwhelming sense of obedience to the Father. In Jesus, we see the amazing nature of the Trinity at work. We understand sometimes that God is one person. Uh, God is uh, one, but in three persons. And we have a hard time wrapping our head around that. And how do those three persons relate to each other? Well, in Christ Jesus, we see that Jesus is absolutely obedient to the Father. God the Father has sent Christ the Son on a mission. It was a, not a very pleasant mission. I'm just going to be honest with you. In Philippians chapter 2, we read that Jesus on this mission humbled himself. Think about this for a second. Here you have God incarnate. And how does he become incarnate? Through a child in a backwater place, in a backwater country. How does he become incarnate? He becomes incarnate just like all of us, taking on human flesh. And the Bible tells us that he became obedient, even to the point of death. And not just any death, but the death on a cross. So what drives Jesus? Jesus is first and foremost driven by obedience to the Father. Now, when we hear that word obedience, the natural person within us, the natural man, the natural woman within us, we rebel against that. We don't like hearing that word obey. It bothers us because we want to question it immediately. We want to wonder what's going on with that. The problem there is that we don't have trust in the Father. We need to understand that the Father loves us, the Father cares for us, and the Father has given us an example in the Son of what it is to have that obedience. And Jesus was obedient, and that's one of the things that drove him that's one of the things that motivated him. That's one of the things that caused him to accomplish his purpose. And I think that's something for us to remember as well. That if we want to be driven and wonder what's driving us, we know, need not look any further than to Christ and to see his obedience. The second thing, the second way in which Jesus was driven, the second way Jesus proved to be an immovable force going forward, was his immeasurable love for the lost, the last, the least, and the lonely. Please understand, friends, God in Christ Jesus had a special place in his heart for the marginalized of this world. God in Christ Jesus had a special place in his heart for the oppressed of this world. God in Christ Jesus had a special place in his heart for those who had been rejected, God had a special place in his heart for that. And the reality is this. 
that all of us, at one point in our lives, have been that person. Perhaps we've been lost spiritually. Perhaps we have been last in terms of how the world might see us, maybe in, at work or in school or least. Or perhaps we have been alienated from loved ones and feeling lonely. Christ had an incredible place in his heart for the lost, the last, the least, and the lonely. And that drove him forward. And friends, it should drive his church forward because we are the body of Christ to this day. And that should be one of the things that drives us into our future. Today we kick off our 50th anniversary of a congregation. Believe me, because of the COVID pandemic, it's been a challenge. A challenge to say the very least, to have any kind of celebration together. This has been a great opportunity to start that celebration and we're continuing to try. But we need to recognize as the body of Christ, as the body of Christ here, right on 4601 South University Drive, we are the body of Christ here and we are driven to show the love of God to the lost, the last, the least, and the lonely. So not only has Jesus given us an example to what it is to be driven by his overwhelming sense of obedience to the Father, but also his immeasurable love for the lost, the last, the least, and the lonely. A third thing, Jesus also had an earnestness to rescue people from the power of sin. Jesus had this absolute earnestness to rescue people from the power of sin. Now, that may look different in each of our lives. The power of sin in your life might look like a destructive behavior, which you happen to particularly enjoy. But nevertheless, it's an incredibly destructive behavior. It might be a behavior that keeps you from de developing great relationships. It might be a behavior that might alienate people in your life. It might be a behavior that might alienate you from God. But Jesus earnestly desires to rescue you from destructive behaviors. Also, Jesus earnestly desires to rescue you from misplaced trust. Oh, we trust in all sorts of crazy things, friends. Please understand that. The craziest thing we trust in, do you know what the craziest thing we trust in is, friends? The craziest thing we trust in is ourselves. When we put our trust in ourselves, I want to tell you something. We can be sorely deceived. Our trust should lie solely in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our trust should lie solely in God and His Word. Our trust needs to be there. And we misplace trust. We put faith in other things. We put faith in people. We put faith in institutions. We put faith in political systems. These are all misplaced. Our trust should only be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our trust should only be in God the Father. Our trust should only be in the Holy Spirit who has revealed himself to the Word. Indeed, our trust should not be misplaced. A third thing that Jesus has come to rescue us from is our ignorance from the truth. Sometimes people are willfully ignorant of God's Word. They choose not to read it. They ignore it. They think it is antiquated. And yet, it is the place where they can find eternal life. Peter said, this Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And friends, please understand this. It is the Word of God that gives us that life because it is God's Word that spoke this world into existence. It is God's Word that spoke life into our first parents. And it is God's Word that speaks life into us today through the power of the Holy Spirit. At our own peril, at our own peril, we remain ignorant of the truth of God's Word. Jesus came to rescue from that ignorance. And lastly, Jesus also came to rescue us from foolhardy indifference. Sometimes we live just indifferent lives, careless about the life that God's given us, careless about the things that God has entrusted to us, careless about all manner of relationships that we have, and we're indifferent to them. 
And Jesus has come to rescue us from that indifference. Friends, please understand, Jesus was absolutely earnest, earnest beyond measure about rescuing people from the consequence of sin. And finally and fourthly, not only was Jesus driven, not only was he driven by an overwhelming obedience to the Father, not only was he driven by an immeasurable love for the lost, the last, the least, and the lonely, not only was he driven by his earnestness to rescue people from their sin. Jesus, friends, listen carefully. Jesus, Jesus was driven by an urgency of the harvest. Now, you've heard me profess this before, my ignorance of things agricultural. I would neither grew up on a farm or a ranch. But I do see the earnestness. I do see the urgency with which the harvest is received. I do see the urgency with which it is reaped. I do see the urgency with which people go out into the field and recognizing now is the time. And Jesus understood that. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that he might send workers out into the harvest. Friends, it is our mission to go out into the harvest, that spiritual harvest that is great around this uh, area that we live. There's no shortage of opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people, friends. Please understand that. There is absolutely no shortage of people that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. There is no shortage of broken lives that need to be rescued from sin. There's no shortage of marginalized people who need to have the love of God poured out from them. There's no shortage of our need to be obedient to the word of God and experience the blessing that comes from that, that we trust and obey and that we look to Christ and to Christ alone. Friends, I, 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 you've driven all kinds of different things here. You've driven trucks, SUVs, Muscle cars, saw some convertibles at the earlier service. You've driven all sorts of conveyances here. The question isn't, what do you drive? The question is, what drives you? What drives you? Dear friends in Christ, let me say this. All we need to do is look no further to our Lord Jesus Christ to see the model, that example, of what we are to be driven by. And that is this, obedience to the Father, love for the lost, earnestness to rescue the lost and the sin, and that urgency for the harvest. Let us pray. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, thank you for this great gathering today. Thank you for the great celebration that we're about to embark upon. Thank you for the opportunity to get together to, to receive food. I pray for the food that we're about ready to receive. Uh, I thank you for, for the food trucks that have come and the vendors. Lord, I pray now that uh, you would uh, bless this time. And that what I mean by this time is the next season. Lord, as we embark upon a new season, Next week, starting with Alpha. This day, starting with the celebration of 50 years of gospel ministry. Lord, help us to go forward into that season focused on you. And all God's saints said, Amen. Amen. Amen.